Good morning. I know that many of you have been stressing over what do you need to study for class? How can I get organized for class? So this is a brief overview of what we're going to be covering in the cellular alterations class. So I just wanted to give you a heads up of how it might help you prepare. And then to even get you ready, I'm going to give you the background story on why cancer occurs so that we can hit the ground running and talk about the nursing care in class. Let's see, up in shared files, I have placed a Word file, which is the class content. Rather than put up a big PowerPoint, I put it into a Word file. If that doesn't work for you, let me know, but I think sometimes you, this way you can make it your own. I've put up a game to help you practice some of the new terms, some of the content. There's an excellent Excel file of nursing implications because it's all about the nursing implications. It's not about the pathophysiology. So how do we care for someone receiving chemotherapy? I also put up a file called Getting Ready. This is not a mandatory file, but sometimes in clinical you have patients with cancer. These are excellent evidence-based resources for you to use as you prepare. There are some wonderful videos and some excellent articles. So let's talk a little bit about the pathophysiology of cancer, what happens at the cellular level, and where we go from there will be in class. Your book calls cancer, defines cancer as a disease of the cell in which the normal mechanisms of growth or proliferation are destroyed. So now I need all of you to put on your thinking caps and go back to anatomy and physiology because we have to kind of go back to the cell cycle, how do cell be, and how does a normal cell usually behave. The video here we're going to show in class, but I included it here because it's a little review of how cells work. Um, as a nurse, you don't need to know this inherent. Let me repeat that. As a student preparing for a test, I am not going to test you on cell growth. This you learned already in anatomy and physiology. But to understand the nursing implications and to understand the role of the nurse caring for a client with cancer, you have to be able to appreciate this to understand why we use certain treatment modalities. Let's talk about the cell cycle. As you know, in normal cells, there's a dynamic equilibrium. What do we mean by that? The number of new cells produced equals the number of dead cells. That's how we maintain the tissue health. Cell cycling is controlled so that the organ maintains its function. So often a disease occurs because we have overload of cell cycling. And let me just give you a really quick example. When someone has psoriasis, there's too many skin cells being produced. So it's an abnormality of the skin cell production. Normally, the process of cell division is only activated during cell death or when the body has a need. Think about it. When do we have more WBCs? We need to fight an infection so the body inherently will produce more WBCs. When do we have an abnormal production of WBCs? And Mrs. Howard's going to be talking about this in hematology, is when you have a leukemia going on. So there's always either this dynamic equilibrium, and when something happens, it means there's a disease in the cell. What's dedifferentiation? This means that cells of a particular tissue will only become that tissue as they grow and mature. So in other words, skin cells do not become muscle cells. We don't change. And all skin cells will usually look alike. And I know that when you had anatomy and physiology, you lined up cells, looked at them under a microscope, and said, okay, by the basis of how they look and by the basis of the type of cell, you could then identify what type of cell it was. And it's an orderly process that progresses from a state of immaturity to a state of maturity. What happens in cancer is all bets are off. The cells no longer behave the way they should they revert back to an earlier stage of development. The other thing that we know about cells is cells, and I'm going to talk to you as if they're people, but obviously they're not, but when cells grow, they line up in order, they, and they respect the boundaries of the other cells. So when you look under a microscope, you could see the cell line, and you could see exactly what they're supposed to look like. So they'll normally spread about until they come in contact with another cell. Then they adhere to each other and align in parallel fashion. They respect the boundaries. What happens in cancer is this ability to respect the boundaries is lost. So a cell will spread out and infiltrate the surrounding cells. So how does this happen? What happens in our lives or what happens as we grow, go along 
that causes this changes at the cellular level. What we've learned through research, and there's really not one cause for cancer, it's a multiple factorial disease. We have initiation first. Carcinogens, and carcinogens are any substance that can initiate cancer. So sometimes they're chemicals. And we know that as we read the newspapers, there are certain parts of the countries that will have chemicals that are causing a high rate of cancer in that area. It can be a physical factor. And a physical factor that we talked about a few weeks ago in class is when we talked about someone with ulcerative colitis being a high risk for cancer development because over time the chronic inflammation is changing the actual physical structure of the colon. And biologic agents, that could be something like um, a nuclear issue where somebody is exposed to nuclear radiation. Another physical factor that we're going to talk about more in class would be smoking. And these all cause cellular mutations. Now our bodies are amazing things. You know from biology that the role of a cell, it will often, the RNA, the DNA, will do whatever it has to do to repair the cell. And so the cell will start to correct itself. But over time, too many mutations makes it impossible for the cell to correct itself. And the other defense mechanism we have is that abnormal cells are what? They're removed by our immune system. But when we're overloaded with abnormal cells, the immune system can no longer work. We call this mutation. So the next stage is promotion. A single alteration in a cell is not enough to cause cancer. You need the odds to be increased by other promoting agents. And promotion is characterized by the reversible proliferation of altered cells. So the perfect example of this is smoking. Smoking promotes cellular damage and it also promotes extension of the cellular damage. So therefore, if I quit smoking, that stops and I stop at that point and the lung, for example, can begin to heal itself. Smoking is a complete carcinogen because it's capable of initiating and promoting cancer. The third and final stage is progression. So now I have all these abnormal cells. I keep doing what I'm doing or I'm constantly being exposed to the same carcinogen and therefore now this is growing. And the final stage is the increased growth rate of the tumor and the ability of the tumor to invade other tissue. And we call this metastasis. And what happens is there's an invasion of neoplastic cells from the primary tumor into the surrounding tissue. And then once it gets into the surrounding tissue, we know that it can penetrate the blood and the lymph, and from there it can travel throughout the body. And then it'll set up a new site at a distant site. So sometimes you'll hear that cancer treatment will target this. If we can stop this pr progression, if we could stop the ability of the tumor to produce its own blood supply, then it's going to stop that progression to another site. So I hope that's a little quick overview to help you understand the pathophysiology. Obviously, it's much more in depth, but if you keep that in mind, you're going to understand the difference between a cancer cell, which we call a malignant cell, and a benign tumor. A benign tumor, the, the biggest characteristic between a cancer cell and a benign tumor is a cancer cell can metastasize. So even though someone can have a benign tumor, we usually say it has a good prognosis. However, a benign tumor can be a problem because it's still sitting there and occupying space. But it's going to occupy space and cause pressure in that area, but it will not travel to a distant site. So you can have a benign tumor of your brain, yet we have to do surgery because it's occupying space and affecting the function of the organ. However, a malignant tumor of the brain will now be able to set up shop elsewhere. So that's the difference. A malignant tumor travels.